Hello and welcome to another edition of Shattered Lives. I'm Paul Healy, I'm crime correspondent with the Irish Daily Star and Irish Mirror, and I'm joined today, as ever, by Michael O'Toole, the crime and security editor for both papers. How's it going, Mick? I'm very, very well, Paul. How are you? Are you still insisting I'm not your boss? You're, you're not my boss. I don't want to be your boss. Just Imagine for the record. With Healy. Jesus. For the record. Just say that again a little louder. Say it, say it again, say it again, say it again. You're not, Go no, on. no, you're not my boss. Yes. Am I? I, 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 I have a very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're breaking up. Anyway. Right. On this baking hot day, yeah, and, and Jesus, it's warm. Uh, we are bringing you another week in crime and um, hooray, we're talking about the Kinnahans again. But this is a significant development and it's one worth talking about. Well, it remains to be seen whether it's a significant development, but it's certainly visually uh, uh, in terms of something um that we were hoping would happen uh, it's a significant development in terms of senior guardi are now visibly showing themselves over there in the uae um you know proven to us all that they are still trying to make efforts to bring the kinnens home so guard commissioner drew harris jetted out to dubai there on monday well we learned of it on monday um and this was a surprise to us all but it was first reported there in the irish examiner much to our annoyance, Mick, you might speak about your annoyance about being scooped. I, I, I take it personally when I get scooped. By you <laughs> or as, as a colleague and friend and by anybody else. Do, do you not really get cheesed off when somebody else gets scooped? It's great. Maybe that's a good sign that we're so competitive. I know Cormac, lovely fella, he's in my elite, elite circle. But Jesus, do I get wound up when other people get good stories. Ah, yeah, well, fair play to Cormac. Uh, it's a brilliant story. Um, and obviously then later the, the guards gave us a statement uh, confirming it. And then the photograph emerged of Drew Harris meeting senior police there in Dubai. Um, and I just want to read out the name. But there's a press release that's been released today now from uh, Dubai police themselves. Um, so, yeah, Drew Harris met um, Lieutenant General Abdullah Khalifa Al-Mari. So he's the commander in chief of the Dubai police. Um, so he met his equal effectively. Um, and also joining him was uh, the Assistant Commissioner of Serious and Organised Crime, Justin Kelly. So Justin Kelly, for our listeners, is overseeing um, all of the various bureaus investigating uh, crime in, in, in Ireland. So, you know, that includes your Criminal Assets Bureau, your Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau. Um, and he he's very much leading or is the most senior officer leading the investigation into the Kinahans. So the two of them met these senior police officers, and really, whilst they didn't come out and directly say it, this is an effort, or is appears to be an effort, to deport Daniel Kinahan, his father, and his younger brother out of the United Arab Emirates, if they're still there at all. But what, what did you make of it, Mick? Did you think this is a little bit of a PR exercise or, you know, from what we're hearing from our sources, is there something to this? Yeah, no, I, I heard people say it was a PR exercise. I disagree vehemently with that. I don't think Drew Harris and I don't think Justin Kelly are the sort of fellas who'll sit there and go, let's go to Dubai and fool the papers for a week. So I, I definitely <laughs> don't think it's, it's, it's a PR stunt. I think um, there was serious intent there. I think... Uh, they've already probably got an agreement to kick. Look, we always say this. Remember all the reports about him being, about him being in Iran about traveling. We don't know, but I'm guessing that because Justin Kelly and Drew Harris went over there, they have a good idea. And if you remember, uh, Justin Kelly was did a sort of doorstep a few months ago, and he said, "We believe we know where Daniel Kinnan is." Do you remember that when he spoke about all the evidence and stuff? So you know, I think if. If, if people say things, we we'll have to take it at face value. So for me, I think this is very, very significant. And I think this is part of a choreography. And to my mind, they were over there to get a promise or an undertaking that when the day comes, if and when, as we know, the director of public prosecutions is currently examining files in relation to Christy, Christopher and Daniel Kinnan. So there's no decision made yet. Could be tomorrow. It could be in a month. Who knows? Could be a year. But I think this is all about if we have the go for a charge. We want your word or your agreement that you'll kick these boys out and we can take them back to Ireland. So I think it's high stakes diplomacy. And I think 
you know, there's that whole thing about in the art of war, you only commit to something when you're assured of the outcome. I think they only went over there because they knew they would get a positive response. In other words, I don't think they're coming back with their tail between their legs. I think they're coming back with what they wanted. Yeah, you would hope so. I mean, especially to make such a public meeting, to, to publicise it shows a, a degree of confidence. You would hope that they they believe there's something behind this, you know, that it's not just about, um, you know, a PR exercise as some people have suggested it might be. And, you know, the other point, you read out the names of the, le- the Lieutenant General and all those senior people. I was looking at the press release. I, I think there were probably maybe 10 senior officers mentioned in that press release, including the head of the police. So, you know, that's a big statement for the Dubai, Dubai police. They're not trying to minimise this. They're putting all their big guns front and centre. So for me, that's an under, another indication that there are things afoot. And for me, it's a very strong indication that they have got an agreement with the Guardi. Yeah, I, I think the, the statement from the Dubai police is particularly interesting because whatever about Shia Khan say about the meeting and the success of the meeting, we, we kind of know what their goals are. But to hear from the Dubai police specifically indicates to you where they are on 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 this they've said the meeting is aimed to strengthen cooperation in combating money laundering cross-border crimes and cyber crimes and facilitate the exchange of expertise in various fields um during the meeting lieutenant general al mari underscored the dubai police commitment to strengthening its international relations and partnerships and facilitating the exchange of knowledge, expertise and best practices in security and law enforcement uh, across diverse fields of operation. So uh, they called it a successful visit as well. So good language coming out of it. Yeah, so they're clearly bigging it up. In fact, the guards, OK, the, the Drew Harris posed for the photograph, they're not really bigging it up the way the Dubai police authority are. are they really, there's been no, maybe uh, uh, Drew Harris will, will doorstep in the next time, maybe at the there's a couple of supers conferences coming up and that sort of stuff. So we can talk to him about that. But it's clear to me that the, the Dubai authorities are bigging this up. Remember, it's all political. There is, just to remind listeners, there is no extradition treaty between Ireland or any other EU country and Dubai. But Dubai can extradite or expel people like Raphael Imperiale, who was one of Kenyon's best buddies. So, you know, if it happens, the Dubai authorities will decide and they'll do it very quickly. Yeah, and, and, you know, I was just doing a bit of digging on um, the meeting as well, just trying to establish what were the other goals, if anything. And one name that possibly isn't a surprise was Sean McGovern. Um, and in a way, uh, I think that's the first result of this meeting that we're going to see, which is hopefully the deportation uh, of Sean McGovern from the United Arab Emirates and uh, him coming back here to face a charge in relation to the murder of Noel Duck Egg Kerwin. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, remind people of who Sean McGovern is, and we can speak about that because I think it's a name that maybe gets lost in the ether a little bit, but he's a, a centrally important character in the Kinahan cartel um, and is very much seen as Daniel Kinahan's right hand man. Um, 37 year old uh, Crumlin native was very close friends with the Byrne family, in particular David Byrne, uh, who was murdered in the Regency Hotel, as everybody knows. Um, and when the Americans, the Department of Treasury, announced the sanctions last year, they actually described him as Daniel Kinahan's advisor and closest confidant um, and said that uh, all dealings with Daniel Kinahan go through Sean McGovern. So that shows you his importance. And then if you remember in that announcement last year, the guards publicly announced a European arrest warrant um, against Sean McGovern. So uh, he was wanted from that moment on publicly in Europe. Uh, so that was a significant step. But we were hearing even then whispers that, OK, it's a great step that they've done that. But the word was McGovern's in Dubai. So the European arrest warrant was kind of slightly useless unless he steps into a European country. But I think reading between the lines now and what was said to me uh, yesterday uh, is that they may use the this meeting that they've had and they they used it to... Um, communicate their want to to have Sean McGovern deported and so their hope is that the uh, police here and the authorities will now cooperate have McGovern booted out and it's very much a test case in a way for what they then want to do with the Kinnahans should the DPP decide charge them. And and just to reiterate a European arrest warrant can only be issued for the purpose of charge Yes, and that's the key difference so the authorities here have already decided McGovern is to face is to be charged with murder 
So that's a big thing. And so it is. I mean, that's they're pushing it an open door there, really. Well, you'd hope so, because there has been some frustration as to him not being extradited yet. I mean, the, the warrant has been out for over a year. Um, you mentioned Imperiale, like the Italian, the Italian government got involved in that. I think the prime minister went over and basically pleaded with the authorities, you know, we've got a warrant for this guy, and then they booted him out. So I think I hope, I think the guards are hoping to match that model. They've gone over there and now said, listen, this guy's wanted in our country. We have an arrest warrant out for him. Um, and so they're hoping that the authorities cooperate with that. And if that is fruitful, then they'll use the same model if the DPP decides to charge, uh, decides to allow them to go ahead and charge the Kinahans. Um, the other, I just want to mention the murder of Noel Kerwin, just again to remind people he was a 62-year-old uh, father of two, and uh, <clears throat> he was living in Clondalkin, innocent man by all accounts. Uh, but the reason that he was murdered it, it's extraordinary. It, it's a really telling of, of, of what the, the few times were like in 2016. If you were in any way associated with or seen to be associating with the Hutches, um, you were, your life was in danger. And Noel Kerwin was sitting in his car, I think, I believe, in his driveway when, when a gunman in, in December of 2016. And uh, the reason being they believe was because he was photographed he was seen in the company of jerry the monk hutch uh, at eddie hutch's funeral earlier that year um people may recall the photograph of jerry hutch at the funeral wearing a cap and uh, somewhat disguised at his own brother's funeral uh, there in march of 2016 and noel Kerwin was photographed next to him and based off that association alone uh noel Kerwin, known as duck egg uh, was murdered and and I mean we did a bit of digging on them at the time didn't we like we tried to establish was there any kind of you know suggestion of criminality or any associations with but he by all accounts seemed to be just with the wrong person at the wrong time um and and that's why he was murdered yeah and it you're you're quite right the, the we're looking back now it was more than seven years ago but I think it's fair to say it really was a febrile time. There were lots of things happening. You know, it was a natural to see armed guardy mountain roadblocks when we were going into work every day. And the, the tension and the paranoia was everywhere. But I think it's understandable because Noel Kerwin had nothing to do with the feud. He he was a lifelong friend with Jerry Hutch. And they killed him because he drove him away from Eddie's funeral. Uh, so, you know, there was paranoia, but I think there was justifiable paranoia. People were genuinely worried that anybody was at risk. Yeah, and now Sean McGovern is linked to this murder, uh, centrally linked to, the, to this murder. They and they're going to they want to charge him with it. Um, that will be probably, um, I'm just trying to think of a more high high profile charge in this feud. Um, I think that to date will be, uh, outside of Jerry Hutch, obviously, <laughs> um, the most high uh, maybe on the Kinahan side of things, the most high profile, uh, the 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 highest on the on the ladder to be charged. Well, yes, um, and re- and it is important to say, and the way that I first heard of McGovern was through the context of of Byrne, uh, of David Byrne and, and Liam Byrne. But it, it you did start to hear about him that he had gone over to Dubai and he had got incrementally closer and closer and closer. Um, I will say, look, there have been a lot of high profile trials. Fat Freddie Thompson was an extremely high profile trial, and he was central to the feud in Dublin to the the day to day running of the feud. But, but I think. You know, with the people like Brady and Patrick Keating who are in prison now, it's clear that Gardy would believe that uh, McGovern is getting closer and closer and closer to the, the, the centre of power in the, the Kinnan organisation. Yeah, and you see it there mentioned in the sanctions by the US authorities. Certainly the, U- the US uh, intelligence appears to be the same, that he is Daniel Kinnan's right-hand man. Daniel Kinnan runs the gang. I mean, I know we're talking about Christie Senior possibly ending up being charged, but really Christie Senior was supposed to have stepped away to some extent. Uh, Daniel was controlling the cartel. I'm also reading elsewhere, and I don't know whether you've been hearing this yourself, but just thought I just thought of it there. But that there, there supposedly is a rift. I think you you wrote about this years ago that there was a rift between fa- father and son. Yeah. So look, journalists hear things at different times. I'm not going to criticize anybody because you know. Some, I'm sure some of the stories I've done, people will say I had that a year ago. So I won't go into that. But look, you hear what you do. And I can remember that there was there were tensions there. I think, I look, I always say this. If if Christy Sr. was running the show in 2016 and 2017, 
I think it's fair to say the feud would not have gone the way it did. He's an old head, smart man. We know, for example, he was involved in, you know, negotiations before the murder of Gary Hutch that started the whole feud. He was involved in, you know, trying to sort things out there. So, you know, I can even remember we spoke about Eamon Dunn on the last pod. You know, he, he was he was a psychopath. And I remember Christy Kinnan back in the day brought all the major criminals who used him for drugs, including uh, Dunn, together at a boxing match. And it was all sort of, lads, keep the head down. Don't be killing each other. Let's just make money. And that's what he's married to. So, you know, I, I think that's part of the tension between the parties. And also just in relation to McGovern, obviously he was shot at the Regency, wasn't he? He was, yes. He was shot at the Regency and he didn't cooperate with Gardy at the time. That actually came out in the um, in the trial of Jerry Hutch. There was evidence given to that effect that Sean McGovern was spoken to and um, that his brother at the time uh, told Gardy to fuck off uh, <laughs> basically just tried to speak to him about you know who shot you or whatever so he didn't cooperate um, obviously he survived that but his, his, his good friend David Byrne was the victim of the murder victim in that um, I think throughout there have been photographs at the time in 2016 of McGovern in the company of, of, of Freddie Thompson and of Liam Byrne and all of those senior heads so he has always been to some degree central but now as you say he's moved closer to Daniel it'll be fascinating to see does this meeting you know, in the weeks and months that now follow, are we going to see Sean McGovern extradited, brought back here? And if that happens, I think that spells bad news for the Kinahans because it shows it's game over in the in Dubai. So on, as long as they're still there, and certainly it seems like the Garda intelligence is that they're still there. Yeah, I wonder what will happen if, say, if McGovern does go, will the Kinahans, if they are still there, will they just sit in their arses and wait for it to happen? Or will they try and do a runner? Can they do a runner? Look, who knows? Where could they go? I think, you know, and the guards have said this before, that uh, it's all about kind of just squeezing them out slowly. And if you see the release that was brought out by uh, Garda headquarters there yesterday, um, there have been senior Garda now stationed in other parts of the world. So they've, they've placed a, a detective superintendent, obviously, in Dubai, but they're also placing one in Colombia. I thought that was noteworthy. He's a DI and right. he's been there for probably 18 months, but they are sending one to Thailand. Thailand as well. But but, yeah. but what's really interesting, most liaison officers are guardian of sergeant rank, they're detective sergeant. Okay. Uh, so there's one in London, there's one in Spain, there's a couple in The Hague, there's one in Amsterdam and stuff. The one in, in Colombia is an inspector. He's a very seasoned in, uh, detective inspector. But the one in, uh, in Dubai is a superintendent and that's more senior than any of them. So I think that shows you at, at that level, it's diplomacy. Do you know, I just thought it was interesting that they're sending a real officer, that you, you know, when you're a superintendent and above, you're called an officer in the job. So they've sent an officer. So that's, that shows you the, the intent there, I would say. Yeah, and I just, I think even if they manage to escape, the world is getting smaller for them. Uh, you know, I mean, the, guard, the cooperation with police forces around the world now, it, it's unprecedented. I mean, it, it's it, compared to 2016 even. We do know that da- the Christopher, they can, Daniel can, in, can get access to genuine counterfeit passports. We know that there was a lad in Dundalk who was done for it. So maybe they have false identities ready to go. So that's how they can get out of Dubai or whatever. But I, I think they're in a bit of a bind. Oh yeah, the net's closing. Definitely, you can see you can see that. Um, I just want to mention also, we're speak, speaking about the Kinnahans, obviously Thomas Bomber Kavanagh, uh, another very senior member of the Kinnahan cartel. He's currently serving 21 years in prison in the UK for a conspiracy to import 36 million euro worth of cocaine and cannabis. Um, and he's serving that sentence at the minute in Belmarsh Prison. That's uh, a very, very strict Category A men's prison there. And it's it's actually known as Britain's Guantanamo Bay. So he's in a very strict prison. But on Tuesday there, uh, the latest appearance in court. Uh, so he is accused of these firearms charges. I won't rehearse it all too much because we did a pod on it uh, with John Hand um, earlier last month but uh he's accused of possessing conspiracy to possess firearms possession of a fireball firearm and of a dum dum bullet which explodes prior to impact but this whole thing really is this mad mad conspiracy that was concocted allegedly between bomber Kavanagh, liam byrne uh his own son jack Kavanagh, and a number of others uh to try and reduce his sentence by telling the national crime agency where these weapons were so effectively deliberately ratting uh, to where these weapons were in order to try and reduce 
Bomber Cavan is sentenced, but it appears that the whole thing is after falling flat on their face and they're now all charged and accused in relation to this. But what I thought was an interesting development on Tuesday is that Bomber Cavanagh didn't have to plead. Now, I don't, I don't think we have this precedent in an Irish court because this was for arraignment. So that means that the accused men had to plead guilty or not guilty. Um, and there's, there's, there's two other men that are on trial here. That's Daniel McLaughlin and Sean Kent. Now, they're not names I would have been familiar with. I don't know about you, Mick, but prior to this, I haven't heard of them. Uh, but they are charged between them, 13 charges in relation to this, including perverting the course of justice and the possession of the firearms. And the, those two lads, they both pleaded not guilty there on Tuesday. But Kavanagh, uh, the, a solicitor for Kavanagh, asked, could he not plead uh, on Tuesday? And the reason wasn't immediately forthcoming. I thought that was really unusual. And then towards uh, the end, just as they were wrapping things up for the next um, court date, uh, it was said that Thomas Kavanagh might uh, challenge the charges against him. Um, and ask for them to basically be written off, and he's going to he's going to do, to do that, and there's a process in which they can do that, uh, and basically try basically to to have the charges against him dismissed. But look, he's already doing 21 years in prison, so he's not getting out anytime soon. But uh, that trial, even if it goes ahead, a lot of things have to happen between now and then, including the extradition of Liam Byrne, who's currently in Majorca, and he's fighting that extradition. So they're talking about September of next year for that. And if I'm right, this is all evidence based on the famous Anchor Chat, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, Anchor Chat is a huge part of this case. But also, like, I mean, these lads deliberately wanted to be caught, but uh, in a way they didn't. They didn't know about the, the that's the Anchor Chat that, that busted them, really, in terms of the whole conspiracy, the alleged conspiracy. The reason why I'm asking about that is there have been several legal challenges to EncroChat. They failed, but now that doesn't mean that uh, Kavanagh w- will fail, but I just, you know, he, he, he faces an uphill battle because, and I know that there are other challenges underway, but from what I, I'm aware, most of the challenges have already been rejected because it's obviously it's EncroChat and it's all that, you know, evidence from the data dump from that, but it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. Yeah, we, I mean, that's a process that's going to go on now for some time. Um, but look, he's got an abundance of time there in prison. Uh, it, so, you know, he, he's not getting out anytime soon. And I think he's also facing, you know, potential there. He's still under investigation in relation to uh, criminal assets um, there, uh, as is Liam Byrne. And Liam Byrne is now fighting this extradition with everything he's got. So that'll take some time as well. But it shows you that the senior leadership of the cartel outside of Daniel Kinahan now are in serious, serious trouble. Yeah, but does that not also show you that there was an element of panic? There, the way I understand the allegation is they decided to surrender, uh, maybe anonymously or whatever, to surrender weapons in, in that were caught in Uri and he could use that to re- get his own current sentence reduced. So maybe he said, look, maybe, maybe I don't know what the scenario is. Maybe he said, look, lads, I know where there are three firearms. Can we do a deal or something? But then... It was behind their back. The allegation is they were talking in anchor chat about, yeah, we're going to we're gonna sort out these stupid coppers, basically. But now they've got the anchor chat. So, you know, he well, he's fronting it as a concerned citizen trying to do his best and maybe get a deal. But the anchor chat allegedly shows that this is all part of his plan. So that's why he's in trouble. But I, I just, that shows panic. So you'd wonder how Kenahan and the other Kenahan's are feeling at the minute. And just for the record, I, my own opinion is, I think, you know, there's a very strong chance of Daniel Kinnan being charged. I think there is still a chance of Christy and Chris, uh, and Christopher being charged, but I think it's less likely. I think the focus is Daniel by the guards. I think the focus is Daniel and they're not, you know, p- piling everything on him, but I think they're more optimistic and confident about him being charged. Yeah, well, and remember, this is based off what we know, uh, which there is apparently evidence there to charge Daniel in in relation to a number of things that directing the crime gang. But uh, there were some surprises that came out in the Hutch trial about what they were alleging about Jerry Hutch. Uh, so who knows? Maybe they have some information that we don't know about in relation to Christy, but we'll see. Um, we're batting in the dark as ever in this and we only get to hear a fraction of what is going on. That's just the way it is. Exactly. Another name that came up in the Bomber Cavanagh case that I wanted to mention was Patrick Keating, because that was surprising to me. Uh, so they read out the allegations 
uh, and allegedly one of the men who was involved in this conspiracy uh, to try and uh, have the cops find the firearms and get a lenient sentence for Bomber Kavanagh was Patter Keating. Now, Patter Keating is not charged in relation to this case, although the fact that they have named him in the indictment means that he's probably in trouble. They they may want to speak to him, certainly, because they have gone and used his name now openly in court. But he's currently serving an 11-year sentence uh, here in Ireland um, for the attempted murder of James Mago Gately, so a, a senior Hutch associate. And people might remember that murder attempt, because we were speaking about this before, that Imre Arrakis, uh, Estonian hitman, was hired to carry out this plot. Uh, but the guards were on top of him and they caught him. Um, but Patter Keating was the person who led that conspiracy. And really, uh, you know, his name came up uh, in this case and I, I just thought that it was interesting to make note of it because even when he pleaded guilty in relation to the Michael Gately case, up until then, he wasn't a public figure. Like, he wasn't somebody that we would really have been writing about um, or really have known about to some extent. But, you, I mean, we were talking off air here about you know, you had heard the name before. Yes, I, I, I knew he was, yeah, I knew he was very senior because I remember when he was arrested, it was like, Jesus, they got Patter Keating. So there are a number of people throughout the years um, who have been important cogs in the background. Like I remember even in 2014, writing about a taxi driver who was basically running the operation. Before the, the feud started, maybe 2013, 2014, a taxi driver living in a, in, a, in, a, in a normal house in Dublin. So you hear all these names that we can't really talk about because of Ireland's defamation laws. But I knew about Patter Keating. Uh, I knew his history and I knew that he was central to the Kinnan cartel. And I knew that, you know, he was centre of a DOCB, a Drug and Organised Crime Bureau operation. Also, he was a very, very significant player. And at the time, that was an indication that senior people in the cartel that they were that the cartel was under pressure, and that senior people who normally wouldn't get their hands dirty were having to do that because they couldn't get anybody else to do it because the of of the guard of successes. And now they're in trouble because of it. Um, I'm just trying to line up the dates here, but Patter Keating is alleged to have been involved in this conspiracy around about the time that he was jailed. So I mean, even when he was already going to jail, he was involved in this. Now it shows you the seniority of Bomber Kavanagh that all of these individuals were involved in trying to lessen his sentence uh, allegedly um, I mean it shows you how senior he was and he was named as being the top of the tree of the Kinahan cartel, he was the leader of the Kinahan cartel in the UK uh, and in, in, in Ireland really as as well, to some, well mostly in the, in the UK but that all their stuff was coming through the UK into Ireland but yeah you got the Patter Keating there, another person who is in serious serious doo-doo um, Right. Outside of the Kinnahans, what can we talk about? <laughs> well, let's talk about Simon Byrne and the ra- possible ramifications for Downing. Yes, from one senior cop to another. Yeah, so just obviously people will know that Simon Byrne was the embattled and under pressure chief constable of the PSNI. And he did, he, I think he got a five year term and it was extended by two years four months ago. And it's just amazing, you know, a week is a long time in politics. How long is it in policing? Because it just, it collapsed, his career collapsed all around him, I think, just it went really, really quickly. So, you know, obviously there was, I would anticipate that the Police Federation in Northern Ireland, they said they were going to consider a vote of confidence in him, but he resigned. But now there's a vote of confidence in other senior officers who have, you know, his sort of senior leadership team. So I just, I just found it very interesting. Now there could be ramifications for that. It could be, that senior guardee, I'm not talking about Drew Harris because people love conspiracies about Drew Harris. He's going to give up and go, go to the PSNI. I don't think that'll happen. Why would he? Right. But there may be assistant commissioners or deputy. You know, there may be somebody here who goes, I want that job. It's the next step in my career. So there could be a very senior guard officer. It's up to them, but they could do that. So, But it's just, I just find it really interesting that so there's going to be a vote of no confidence in senior guard, uh, police officers up north. And there is one in the Commissioner Harris, we know this, that the vote is already practically done. The Garda Representative Association has about 11,000 members and they've, they're have they holding a vote of no confidence, a paper, a ballot, postal vote. So the result should be out by the 11th of September, which is next week. Then it has to be ratified. I think it goes to auditors and stuff. And then it's going to be released. 
or published on the 13th of September, so two days later. That's Wednesday, isn't it? I think it's Wednesday. So that's a big day. I would be amazed if the commissioner, shall we say, won this vote. I think it's inevitable that he's going to lose it. I don't know what you think, but I think it's... But the only question for me is, there are two questions. How many GRA members vote? And how big is the majority against the commissioner? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a no-brainer that it's going to be uh, a vote of no confidence. But what, if anything, effect will that actually have? I mean, I know we spoke about this before, but and I kind of said I don't, I didn't think the government could ignore that many Gardaí, um, but they've expressed their confidence in him and they've re- re- renewed his contract till twenty twenty five. So they're then going to go back on what they've said. Uh, it, I think it all depends on how much this blows up within on Garda Shia after the vote. Um, you know, how, how much anger is there going to be? How many people are going to be walking out in protest or whatever it is that they're going to be legally doing to protest, uh, you know, him remaining as Garda boss? That's a really interesting issue because, I mean, the indications are, are we? Do, I think we know this, there's going to be an extra ordinary uh, conference. I think, in, isn't it, at the end of September to discuss to this. It's in Kilkenny, isn't it? So they're going to, so it's basically, it's not just a vote. Let's say it will go ahead. I think you and I agree that he will lose, right? By a big margin. I think they're going to use that as a mandate in their conference to say, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to not cooperate if we don't have confidence in him? Are we not going to cooperate with his senior leadership team? Are we not going to cooperate with him? How can we when you guys have voted against him? So as the GRA leadership, can we have any interactions with the commissioner because we don't have any confidence in him or could it be the, the seismic scenario of a blue flu or withdrawal of labour or whatever you want to call it it happened nearly happened in 2015 didn't it could happen here so you know the vote is nothing in itself it's not the be all and the end all it's what happens after that that is really important yeah it's what happens next so let's see we'll, we'll watch that with interest the last story I want to talk about is uh a super story you had there today um, we would be slightly legally careful about it because obviously it's before the courts but a man named Niall Colgan um, was before the courts and uh, you got wind of this so who's Niall Colgan? Niall Colgan is a Department of Justice official you and I would have had interactions with him he was he was in the in the Department of Justice press office so he was someone who dealt with journalists like me and you now it was as I said, you're right we had to be careful but he's charged with possessing what's legally known as child pornography, what the charge says child pornography, but also causes child abuse materials. So there was a number of images and two videos that he's alleged to have possessed at his home in South Dublin in February 2022. He's also charged with simple possession, not possession with intent to supply of cannabis. So it's up to the judge, but it's a, it's in the hands of the judges. He is back in court on the 21st of September and we'll see what happens there. But I, 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 I uh, approached Mr. Colgan he didn't want to talk. Surreal feeling, doorstepping somebody you've you've known previously. But it, his right was not to talk, and he, and he exercised that. That's right. It, it's no problem. But yeah, it's just an interesting story. Yeah, and I think just in general, uh, um, people sometimes not everybody, but people have a criticism of media that uh, we would only highlight one sector of society when they are before the courts. That's not the case. And it's important, especially uh, when people are in positions of power, government or whatever, uh, when something happens in that field. Of course, we're going to highlight and want to highlight and think it's an important story. And this is a hugely important story. Obviously, we, you know, have dealt with Niall Colgan. uh, But regardless of whether we know somebody or whatever, if they're in trouble with the law, you know, we're going to cover it. Um, And this is something that kind of went under the radar. But I think this is proof that we will pick up on stories like this. Um, and we will give them full coverage and photograph these people when we hear about them. Yeah, and I think it's just interesting because I was speaking to somebody else in a professional capacity the last couple of days, um, and I can't speak for all the other media, but I know you, and I know myself, and I know everybody in the, who does crime in the Star and the Mirror. But, you know, people think that we have a lot of agendas. I don't know, I think they overestimate our intelligence, I'll be completely honest, which is very easy to do, Let's let's be honest. They always sort of think that we're sort of, you know, Svengali like figures who are sitting there like Goldfinger stroking a cat going, how can I plot things today? We're just simple hacks. And I said to this person, if we get a story, we verify it and we run it. So it's not as if we, you know, right, I'm going to bring down the government. 
we're just hacks and wherever we get a story but we so but I think that's refreshingly honest on our part if we get a story about a millionaire or if we get a story about a pauper we'll run the story it's just the problem is getting the information we don't discriminate <laughs> I, you know so I we mean, wish we heard about maybe other, more yeah yeah maybe, maybe there are journalists who decide well you know I don't feel comfortable doing this or whatever and you know it go, I'm a Fianna Fáil voter and I don't like doing that or I'm a Sinn Féin supporter and I don't like doing that we'll just if and I see they say you and I met uh, someone the other day, you remember, and um, I think the point I was trying to make was, uh, we will do stories that your organisation likes and your organisation dislikes, but it's not personal. We just do the stories, and if we do good stories or we do bad stories, we do we just regard them as stories. And I think people outside journalism, they really really overestimate our sophistication. We're hacks, oh, yeah. and that's we, it. We don't have any agenda, like. It's, it's, it's inevitably when you give somebody airtime, somebody else is going to be unhappy about it. But uh, yeah, well, last thing we want to talk about is a little bit lighter, I suppose, but it caused a, a controversy um, that uh, you suggested off air we talk about. So I'm happy to talk about it. I was at Electric Picnic uh, last weekend and um, I was there for the Killers, really. I'm kind of a massive Killers fan. So I went for the day. I was very lucky to go for the day. Not a camper. <laughs> uh, I had the I had the complete fortune to go into Glastonbury earlier this year, and that was brilliant. It was a once in a lifetime thing, and I did camp for that, and it was brilliant. And we got great weather for it, but uh, camp it's not really for me in general. But uh, the Wolf Tones, yeah, I mean, I saw it with my own eyes, um, and I think it was partially because there was at that point in time, I think a lot of acts finished up, and the Wolf Tones were then coming on, so there was just a huge. Like I don't. If you did, you see the aerial footage. It's just a swarm of people just all went to this tent uh, that they were performing in. That's another thing. The tent was too small. It was a big tent, but it was too small for probably the amount of people that wanted to see the Wolf Tones. So I just want to say that I went out of curiosity. I wouldn't really be a big fan, but uh, I I do like the song "Come Out You Black and Tans." I think a lot of people when they hear it uh, do enjoy the song. I think it's a, I suppose I don't really think about the message of it uh, too much. And, and, and uh, I hope I'm not offending people by saying that. But when I hear that song, uh, uh, it's just it's just a good song to listen to. And I never really thought about the message behind it all that much. Now, you might uh, probably think differently about that. But, but I, that, that would be, and that's not really the song where that, that caused the controversy, obviously. But um. That would be the only song that I was there for. I then I couldn't stand the crowd and I walked out. Um, there's a but yeah. there's a great song. The, 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 the Wolf Tones do a great version of Tor Dum the Love, right? Have you ever heard that? And I, as I'm, you know, you know, I'm very green. Tor Dum it means give me your hand, right? Tor Dum the Love, right? And it's one of my favorite songs. As what do you call me, a Republican, a Nationalist, a Green, whatever, because it's about give me your hand, and it's what I believe in. The a, a loyal unionist called it in New Ireland the other day about. We work together. Unionists are not adversaries. I, I view unionists as Irish people. There's some Republicans who just think they're the enemy. They're not. For me, they're Irish people. So I really love that song. It's, it's a really, really important song for me because it's, it's what I believe in. Give me your hand and we'll build a better Ireland together. Right. But but the controversy is about the ooh ah up the ra song. Right. What uh, The Celtic Symphony, is that what you call it? Right. Okay. So I, your view, I think I would be interested in your view because I, as everybody will know, I was born in Belfast in August 1970, lived in North Belfast until 1997 when I came down to the liberated zone, as we call it, got away from the occupied zone. Uh, so I grew up in the Troubles. I still, nobody in my generation sang Uya Up the Ra. It's nobody, and I come from a Catholic Nationalist Republican group. People didn't do it, right? Maybe some did, but just not, it was mad, right? Um, only time I ever heard it, I was 17, walking down Royal Avenue, which is the O'Connell Street in Dublin, in Belfast. And there were these two agents in front of me and they were singing Ooh-Ah up the Ah. I was going, fuck is that, right? Just didn't hear it, right? Now maybe, maybe I know, up, up west, whatever. So I'm going to give you my view as someone who lived through the conflict. It was the conflict. I left 97 after the second ceasefire. So I was a troubles baby the whole way. I believe, and this is me as a 53-year-old man who lived through all, who lived through the worst of it, right? I firmly believe that 19-year-old Jamie Joes and Sarah's and whatever, when they sing Ooh Up The Ra, they are absolutely not 
supporting the IRA, blowing up British soldiers or killing people, boys in Warrington. They are singing an anti-authority song because old fogies like me look down on them and look at them disapprovingly for singing that song. So if middle-aged people like me go, you shouldn't be doing that, they're going to go, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it's yeah. just to wind up commentators and, you know, people who... I lived through the troubles. Nobody can lecture me on anything. My well, father survived the murder bait. I've been there, right? Yeah. They are not singing IRA songs. They are not singing support of the IRA. No. Well, like, I mean, as I was only there for the start of the gig and I heard uh, Come Out of Black and Tans and people were singing that with great fervor and uh, I, I enjoyed it. And I It's a great song. But... I think it's kind of the same with that song that, that it's catchy and people like singing it. And there's a certain, uh, what's the word, group think mentality, a group mentality, just everybody, one, one person's doing it, everybody's doing it. But also I think there's an element of, oh, I'm not allowed to say the bad word. I'm not allowed to say the, do the bad thing. So, oh, I'm going to do it, you know, and it feels great to be able to do the forbidden. Like, just first of all, I'm 31, I'm 32 very shortly. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm getting older. But, um, most people in that crowd were way younger, like 19, 20 year olds. So I really, yeah, I think you're right. I don't think they're really that clued in on the conflict. Uh, I know the controversy of it and I certainly wouldn't be screaming it out loud, right? Even with a few drinks in me. That's because uh, you're a, an older and more sophisticated and more worldly wise yeah, than, well, I'm than aware a 19 year old student. Controversy of it. But yeah, I don't think those 19 year old students really thought about it all that much. I think they knew that, like, oh, I'm not really supposed to be singing this. And there is a cert- certain element of kind of devilish joy from singing it. Definitely got that impression that even when I was there, that, that you know, it, it, that kind of rebel sort of like, you know, isn't it, we, isn't it great to kind of do this forbidden little thing? But clearly people are fans because people knew all the songs. Um, so for whatever reason, the Wolf's Hones have picked up a very young audience. I'd be curious as to whether they actually listen to them outside of just gone to a festival. The, 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 the second IRA ceasefire, the one I spoke about when I, I left in September 27, was in July 1997, right? The Good Friday Agreement was in Good Friday in 1998, right? That's 25 years ago. How many of those young people singing that song who were gathered around you were even born when the Good Friday Agreement came along? So they have no, how can you criticise them? Because it's just something that's on really, ruling in the years or, you know, spotlight or whatever. So they're kids. They're kids. They're just kids. I agree. Yeah, I I think that's the thing. There was mostly kids. Yeah, very, very young people really at that gig. So the only thing that surprised me was that they, 